Relax, relax. We're not at that part oh, yet. Oh, I thought that you were taking care of this. I really did. And now those Guidos say we gotta do them a favor. You mean I gotta do them a favor. Oh, oh, of course that's what I mean. Do I look like I can intimidate a jury? I couldn't intimidate a child, and believe me, I've tried. Released nearly one year after the massive success of Grand Theft Auto 3, Grand Theft Auto Vice City would see DMA Design, establishing the Rockstar North label. Taking inspiration from movies like Scarface and shows like Miami Vice, GTA Vice City was essentially the starting point in terms of the overall timeline for the 3D trilogy. While there was some concern about a sequel to GTA 3 coming out so soon and whether it would replicate the same brilliance, Vice City made its own way, delivering an open world steeped in detail, memorable characters, and lots of content. It would become one of the most successful titles of the PlayStation 2 era. Fans will have a chance to revisit Vice City when Grand Theft Auto The Trilogy The Definitive Edition launches on November 11th. So here's a quick refresher of the story for those who want to look back on all the good vibes, violence, and insanity. Before the turn of the millennium in the City of Liberty, and before the gang wars in San Andreas, there was Vice City. Based on 1980s Miami, illicit substances, neon-drenched districts, and parties dominated the city. A more suave crowd has risen up over the years, benefiting from various criminal trades. While the street gangs of yesteryear were low on the pecking order, the story begins in 1986 with Tommy Versetti finally leaving prison. Tommy is actually from Liberty City, an Italian-American whose father operated the printing press. A meeting with Sonny Forelli would ensure his destiny lay in organized crime, though. Rising quickly through the Forelli family, Tommy would eventually go to jail for murdering 11 men in the Harwood District, an act which earned him the title of the Harwood Butcher. Fifteen years later, and his first destination upon being released, at the behest of Sonny is Vice City. The Forellis are looking to establish their presence in the city, especially given the rise of various trades between it and South America. Tommy meets Ken Rosenberg, a shady lawyer, and goes to deal with the Vance brothers, Vincent and Lance. Things quickly go awry, though. A mysterious group ambushes the deal, killing Vincent Vance in the process. With the goods and money gone, it's up to Tommy to find out who's responsible and get both back. Under threat of consequences from Sonny, of course. After speaking to retired Colonel Juan Cortez, who set up the deal and wishes to find the culprits, and his daughter, Mercedes, Tommy embarks on a journey through Vice City's underworld. There's Ricardo Diaz, a hugely successful baron. Kent Paul, a music producer who seems to think of himself as some kind of criminal mastermind. And real estate developer Avery Carrington, roughly in that order. Tommy pays Kent Paul a visit and learns that Leo Teal may have more information. Leo Teal is a cook that also happens to be a hitman named Mr. Black. Things don't go so well, though. On their first meeting, Teal quickly attacks Tommy, who then beats him to death. It's here that Lance, the surviving Vance brother, enters and sarcastically notes, Oh, way to go, tough guy. Beat him to a pulp. That should make him real chatty. You want some too? Hey, chill. I want what you want, brother. With Vincent dead, he teams up with Tommy to find out who's responsible. Avery Carrington is next on the list, owner of Shady Acres. Carrington is a big deal in property development and is used to getting his way, even if that means committing murder or destroying a rival competitor. Fun fact, he mentored Donald Love from Grand Theft Auto 3, which would explain how the latter got the idea of investigating a war between the Yakuza and the cartel. Carrington is having issues with Spand Express, but thankfully Tommy comes along to help him. After weakening a Constitution site's structure, using an RC helicopter and some explosives, and starting a gang war to reduce property prices, Tommy then goes to work for Cortez. His task? Killing former right-hand Gonzalez, who, as it turns out, had been double-crossing the colonel for years. While investigating the potential culprit for Tommy's botched deal, Cortez suggests that Ricardo Diaz, whom Gonzalez was secretly providing information to, may have been the one responsible. Of course, Tommy doesn't immediately go to kill Diaz without learning more. So it's good timing that the next job comes from Ricardo Diaz, who hires both Tommy and Lance for protection in an upcoming deal with the Cubans. Things predictably go south, and the trio must fight their way out. Thanks to their stellar performance, Tommy and Lance take on more jobs for Diaz, from killing members of the Sharks gang and stealing a boat for a deal. 
It's not long before Lance discovers that Diaz is responsible for their deal going bad, and Vincent dying. Interestingly, this isn't the first time that Diaz has worked with the Vance brothers. In Vice City Stories, he hired them for several jobs. Interestingly, it was at this time that Diaz learned of Gonzalez, secretly stealing from Colonel Juan Cortez. In exchange for his safety, Gonzalez would inform Diaz of Cortez's deals, which is how he learned of the deal between the Vance brothers and Tommy all those years later. While Tommy suggests being patient and gaining Ricardo's trust, Lance goes off on his own to kill him. Obviously, this backfires, and it's up to Tommy to save Lance from the junkyard. Before Diaz can mount a proper retaliation, the duo attack first, killing him in the mansion. I would have had you made! Say goodnight, Mr. Diaz! So technically, that's the end of Tommy Versetti's story, right? The good guys win, and the sun sets on Vice City? Not quite. With Diaz's mansion and assets now his, Tommy begins establishing his own empire in Vice City, supporting various gangs, purchasing failed businesses, and using them as fronts, and essentially becoming the sole kingpin. Tommy begins growing distant, not only from Lance, who asks to be treated as an equal partner, but the Forellis as well. The latter is a problem because, well, Tommy hasn't paid the money back to Sonny. Establishing his own reign over Vice City's trade with the Forellis receiving nothing in return on top of that? That's just asking for trouble. So, Sony sends some of his men down to Vice City to collect. Tommy responds by killing them all and proclaiming that Vice City belongs to him, further incensing his old boss. Sony decides to come down to the city himself, and Tommy looks to respond in a more peaceful manner, preparing a hefty money tribute. The money is counterfeit, but Sony already knows, thanks to roping and Lance and having him betray Tommy. If that weren't enough, it turns out that Sony was responsible for Tommy's arrest 15 years prior, luring him to the Harwood District to take down a rival and ambushing him with 11 men. Tommy survived, though, and just like before, managed to claw his way to the top off Sonny's chagrin. This results in an all-out battle in the mansion as Tommy kills Lance first, and then Sonny and the Forellis to survive. The game ends with Rosenberg arriving at the mansion and Tommy, despite being injured, making him his right-hand man while proclaiming himself as the kingpin of Vice City. It's an ending that would make Tony Montana, in his most anger-induced haze, proud. Here's hoping the same brilliance is captured in the upcoming remaster. That's all for now. If you enjoy what you saw, please hit the like button. And if you're new to the channel, now is a great time to subscribe. We upload brand new videos every single day. After subscribing, don't forget to enable all notifications by clicking the bell icon. Thanks for watching this video, and we'll see you next time, right here on Gaming Bolt.